Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Dan Nguyen with the Intentional Entrepreneur Podcast. I have a very special guest with me today. Uh, he helps high net worth uh, individuals, real estate investors, business owners, and retirees grow their grow and protect their wealth uh, predictably and safely. He is a financial consultant, health and life agent, and has cultivated a reputation for putting his clients first no matter what. He prides himself at attend, uh, in attending all the meetings without expectations or preconceived ideas to ensure that he is solving his clients' problems. I want to welcome to the show, uh, sorry, Ibrahim. Hey, Dan. Thank you so much for having me on, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. M- my pleasure. And so today we're going to talk about the bank on your self-concept. Um, but before we kind of dive into that, can you share a little bit about yourself and how you got into the business you're in? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you for that. So I started um, I started this journey really uh, when I was doing my MBA uh, about six years ago. I was doing my MBA here in Chicago. That's where I'm from. And I was doing originally in project management. I thought I was going to be a project manager and do like the PMP exam, the project management professional exam, and then take that route kind of cor- the corporate, climb the corporate ladder. Um, and as I took the courses and kind of was in that environment, I didn't really click that well with project management. Um, nothing against the subject. I just, you know, how it's, you, you never know what's a good fit for you until you actually do it. Uh, so I, uh, I, I got an internship working at Allstate Insurance in their sales and marketing department. And I love doing that. I loved talking to people. I loved problem solving. I loved understanding like the insurance company's perspective, their products and their services and then how that connects with people. And then being, again, problem solver. It's not so much about insurance, right? Because insurance isn't like a sexy field. Uh, it is what it is about insurance, but rather it's what it could do and how the advisor, the agent helps somebody and how kind of the ongoing relationship. So that's what attracted me. That's what I, that's what I saw myself doing for long term. Um, and then I got into different areas of insurance. So I got into healthcare and I was working like with Medicare products and Blue Cross Blue Shield, Humana, Cigna Health Spring. And then I also enjoyed that as well because now I was like a broker. Now I was representing different companies um, and, and a comp- kind of a different side of insurance. Again, back to problem solving. And um, I was, as, as I was learning, I also le- started to realize that people became very comfortable talking to me about money. Like they would go beyond insurance and say, well, I make $80,000 a year and 20% goes to taxes and I'm only left with this much, you know, and I'm looking for savings and I would research and things like that. And I, I, I like that topic. So mm-hmm. um, I read a book called The Bank on Yourself Revolution by Pamela Yellen, which talks about financial concepts and, and growing uh, your wealth predictably. Read the book, The Bank on Yourself Concept. And then at the end of it, there was a section that said, if you wanted to join our organization as uh, as an advisor, I applied, got accepted, and then now I'm a bank on yourself professional, and I have a company called Financial Asset Protection, and this is exactly what we do. We do bank on yourself concept for real estate investors and business owners, and help them grow wealth predictably and safely. Mm, sounds sounds really good. So, um, tell us a little bit about the bank on your your yourself concept uh, for the people who don't know what what the strategy is. Yeah, definitely. So uh, it's a strategy. It's yeah. it's also known as the infinite banking concept. So mm-hmm. I think a lot of people know it by that concept too, is especially a lot of real estate investors. Mm-hmm. Um, and what it is, it's a it's a way, it's a method. Um, it's a method of growing wealth outside of the stock market. And it's also mm-hmm. a way for you to become your own source of financing. So this way you don't have to go to banks for mm-hmm. financing. You go to yourself. Now, like on a fundamental or like technical level, like what exactly is it? It is the use of cash value whole life insurance mainly used for the cash benefits rather than the life insurance. So it's high cash value life insurance used for living purposes while obviously you're still alive to fund your deals, to fund your business, to pay payroll, to expand to other locations, kind of all internally done through your own banking system. So kind of 360 view, that's what the bank on yourself concept is and the purposes of it. Yeah. So I think for maybe real estate investors, we can kind of understand, right? They've got a deal here mm-hmm. and maybe they can pull up cash, uh, but maybe talk about just general business owners, right? Like yeah. how can they take advantage of the bank on yourself concept? Yeah, definitely. Look, when I talk to a lot of clients, like one thing they're kind of like, there's like a dilemma I've noticed. There's mm-hmm. like, should I save cash for the future or should I reinvest it in my business? And that makes a big difference for different businesses. Like if it's a high cash business, like you own a manufacturing company, you constantly need like hundreds of thousands of dollars on hand versus mm-hmm. like if you're a financial services firm or a law firm, like you can go like six months sometimes until you get paid or even longer, depending on the case and other situations. So, um, ba- you know, I, I see a dilemma where like, do I save this cash or do I reinvest mm-hmm. it back into the business? And bank on yourself could do both. So you could allocate funds to a life insurance policy, cash by life insurance policy, if it's properly structured, and then build up the cash and then be able to borrow against that to use for your business expenses and talk to your CPA. But there could be certain deductions with the interest you pay. 
uh, towards the borrowing that money. So this way you're able to grow your cash, use it for your business, uh, potentially get tax deductible interest. And you, you're borrowing. I think this is, should be number one is that you're borrowing on your own terms. So, mm -hmm. so you're in control of the line of credit. One huge problem with lines of credit, if you've ever used one from a bank, there's a lot of restrictions around them. And they're, they, they tend to be a callable, meaning that the bank can say, all right, hey, we're cutting off the line of credit. Now you have five years to pay us back the balance and you have to pay it back. It's really, it's in their, the ball's in their court. So right. uh, with the bank on yourself concept, you're in charge of that line of credit. Right, right. So um, you talk about sa saving money, right? So I guess, you know, I, um, one of the differences, like if you need a line of credit or you need a loan, right? Yes. Because you don't have, because you don't have the money, right? Then, <laughs> then you go to the bank. So with with the banking yourself concept, you do need to put that money aside, right? Obviously, part of it goes to the cost of insurance and part of it goes to the, you know, the cash value, but it's not like you can open up the policy tomorrow and then immediately borrow against it, correct? Yeah, very well said, Dan. Exactly. You're, you're exactly right. right. It's not something where I could take a dollar and then go borrow $5 with bank on yourself. Like I could, for example, in real estate, I could do that. I could take a dollar and then buy something that's worth $5. And in mm -hmm. bank on yourself, it's kind of the opposite. It's the reverse of that. There's a capitalization period, a period of time where I have to fund the policy, grow it. And then once it reaches a certain amount of cash that I need, then I can start borrowing and, and, and you can use it that way. But yeah, you're right. Good point that there is a capitalization period, a period of time of actually growing the policy. Okay. So, um, you know, let's talk about real estate investors. Cause I think this is very popular cause they're always borrowing like hard money. Right. Yeah. yeah and sure. so the terms are like really break your knees type of terms. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so like, let's just run into scenario. Like, um, you know, what's, what's their sweet spot? Like when should a, say a real estate investor look into getting one of these policies so they don't have to rely on hard money or any other, you know, friends and family and things like that. And they're paying themselves interest. Yeah, and that's a good question. Uh -huh. So it, it depends on like the their horizon. But so um, the bank on yourself concept, it's a long term strategy. Uh -huh. um, and it, it has different purposes. Like, for example, the first purpose, I think, to bank on yourself, what you could do and you could do this probably day one, you could do this, uh -huh. is that you could start allocating some of your expenses for real estate, like some of your closing costs or some of your legal costs or some of the renovations you could you could start using a bank on yourself type whole life policy immediately for that and then as you start gradually building up money in it then you can start using that for down payments uh, for banks mm -hmm. and for hard money lenders and then once you build up even more cash in that then you could become your own mortgage or your own banker so literally you find a property um let's just say it's a hundred thousand dollars even numbers it's a hundred thousand dollars you can go to the policy and become your own mortgage now you can even get really technical and like start mm -hmm. your own uh, like a separate LLC, that's a financial LLC. Talk to your attorney about that. Mm -hmm. um, but you, there's a lot of a lot of sophisticated clients do that when they're very experienced with infinite banking and bank on yourself. They can do things like that. But yeah, to answer your question, is that there's it, it's really like um, you could use it for different areas of real estate. So from the initial cost, the few thousand dollar cost, to the down payments, the twenty, thirty thousand dollar down payments, to the actual full properties. And it's kind of like um, I, I, like we compare a lot to martial arts where it's like the white belt, you're starting off like very basic, like you're just doing like a policy that's $500, $500 a month, you're building mm -hmm. that up until there's a couple thousand borrowing from that. And then mm -hmm. black belt is where you have your own financial co corporation and you're able to borrow from yourself, get the tax deductions, asset protection, and all the other moving parts. Yeah, you, you mentioned asset protection because uh, you know, I, I as far as, as far as I remember, you know, the cash value life insurance is not uh, basically uh, been able to be attached to creditors, right? Uh, and so uh, I get, I think that's kind of a um, one of the side benefits. Or, you know, obviously people don't buy it for that one particular reason, right? Yes. But that's kind of a whole host of reasons why um, um, they they like uh, you know the, this particular strategy. So we got you know you can um, you know infinite banking, right? Borrow borrow from yourself, borrow from um, on, on the terms that. Uh, you want so you don't have to um, go for the um, use traditional financing. Um, there's some asset protection mm -hmm. um, benefits. Uh, what are what is like maybe one or two more you know benefits that people who are new to this particular concept um, that they could take advantage of if they are using um, banking on yourself? Yeah. So um, in addition to everything you mentioned, there's also tax free growth. So like for example, as I have cash value in the policy, and as it's accumulating in value. I don't pay taxes on that on the growth of the policy internally mm -hmm. um, and then in most situations when you go to withdraw that money or borrow against it those are typically tax-free loans the only thing you have to make sure is that it's not a modified endowment contract non-mech policy mm -hmm. so if it's non-mech then that means that the loans and withdrawals are both going to be tax-free 
if it is a mech policy and sometimes the policy is a mech it's a modified endowment contract okay. and if that's the case then the loans and withdrawals might be treated like a 401k or ira loan or withdrawal they could be taxable there could be also a 10 percent tax penalty if under the age of 59 and a half but mm -hmm. most most of the times we're on the non-mech side and it's the advisor's job to walk you through this process and explain what that mm -hmm. means and make right. sure the policy doesn't mech it doesn't get on the, the, the mech side so uh, tax-free loans and withdrawals, tax-free growth, the income, mm -hmm. uh, the death benefit, if something were to happen to you, would go to your family, income tax-free. There could be estate taxes, but that's like above $13 million, depending mm -hmm. on the state you live in, uh, right. so with it for the most part. So in other words, a lot of tax benefits with it. And then when you combine, and it's kind of, it becomes like um, a very intricate um, concept when you combine, combine it with other areas, like the asset protection, the tax benefits, um, the ability to finance on your own terms, like you could be literally a real estate investor. You could have billions of dollars in assets under management, literally, mm -hmm. and have all these policies with cash value. You have everything, all your properties have outstanding loans against them. And, um, you know, if somebody were to sue you, the only thing really that could be exposed is just mostly talk to your attorney about this, but typically mm -hmm. just the equity in the properties that you own. And then that, there's all the caveats to that, whether it's LLC owned or C Corp or all the things like that. But for the most part, but your life insurance policies are protected. Mm -hmm. um, this is, it, it is state specific, like in the state of Illinois, the state of Florida, very good states for mm -hmm. cash right life insurance. Like Florida has, I think it's the best, correct me if I'm wrong, Florida is Florida's probably the best state in the United States for asset protection, but other states also have the same same rules when it comes to cash value life insurance. Yeah. So um, you, you did mention mix. I don't know if this fall, falls into the mix. So say, say that I'm a very wealthy person and it's like, oh, this is a really good idea. Can I just take a bunch of cash I'm sitting in my bank and say, I want to open this policy and I'm just going to stuff it with the one pay yeah. policy. Is that is that doable? Yeah. So before 1988, that's what a lot of rich people were doing. They were just buying single, it's called a single premium, single premium whole life policy. It's a one-time payment policy. Imagine buying a house cash, a similar idea. You're just buying a one-time life insurance policy, like $500,000, just one, one-time transaction. Um, and a lot of, a lot of rich people were doing that before 1988 and then Congress and the IRS caught up to it. And like, All right, we need to add some, <laughs> some more red tape around this. Mm -hmm. And then that's when they created the Tamra Act which talks about the MEC policies. So even till today, you could still do that. You could take, for example, $500,000 from your checking account, deposit it all into a life insurance policy, own the life insurance policy, the cash value and the life insurance in there, paid up for life and it still grows. But in most situations, it would be a modified endowment contract because you skipped the seven pay test uh, mandated by the IRS. The only way you can do the single premium whole life policy and have a non mech at the same time with all the tax benefits is if the original cash is coming from another life insurance policy that mm. was not a MEC policy. So like in, it's, it's called a 1035 exchange, which is similar to real estate, like a 1031 exchange real estate. Mm -hmm. You could take, for example, 500,000 from one life insurance policy, roll it into a new life insurance policy, and then that would be a, a non-tax uh, transfer. And the new policy would be non-taxable. It'd be a non-MEC policy. All right. Very, very cool. So, um, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, cash value life insurance is a very complex product, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And so, you know, that's why it's really important to have a trusted advisor, um, um, uh, be a part of your team. And, uh, as you probably know, uh, cash value probably got a bad rap and yes. especially, you know, the last, you know, 10 or 10 or 15 years. So, um, you know, what would you say to those, to those people who say, Hey, you know, I read something on the internet that these are, these, these aren't really good. Um, you know, what would you say to people who are um, uh, are quite unsure about how these products work? Yeah, so I would start with the negatives that people mm -hmm. already kind of are already believing right now about life insurance. So, like number one, like it's too expensive, um, and this could be so everything with life insurance that's that you know about or think you know about could be true or it could be false because there's uh, 1,200 life insurance companies in the United States that sell whole life insurance. Um, and of those 1,200 insurance companies, there's maybe 10 or 15 products for each company. And for each product, there's different ways to structure it with the with the life insurance amount. So really, it's hard to say that life insurance is just bl blanket statement, like it's it's all bad. Um, so one one misconception is that it's too expensive. And mm -hmm. if the po the policy is improperly structured, then that could be true. It could be too expensive. But we tend to structure our policy so that way... Um, in year five, between year four and year four, five, the cash growth is already exceeding what you are paying into it. So if you are allocating $10,000 a year, 
we do it so that way by year four or five, your policy, you, you put in 10,000, it grows by 11 or 12,000 already. So mm-hmm. a very short period of, um, of fees associated with the policy and high liquidity mm-hmm. and quick liquidity too. So, so that could be, you know, so that's one myth is it's too expensive. It's that that could be partially true. Mm-hmm. And the second thing too, is that it's, a, it's usually unusual to borrow your own money. Like a lot of people, like for example, Dave Ramsey thinks like, it's like, it's, it's stupid. You have to put money into a life insurance policy and then borrow your own money against it. And the, um, the reasoning is it's actually the way he's wording that is not true is that when you borrow from the life insurance, uh, you're borrowing against the life insurance product that you have, you're actually borrowing from the insurance company's general funds, leveraging mm-hmm. your own cash value as collateral. Now, why would somebody want to do that? Why would I want to borrow against my money when I already have it, when I could just skip all of that and just use cash? And the answer to that is because when you borrow against your money, it continues to grow as if you've never touched it. So that means that if you have a life insurance policy and you're pre- you have your projections in front of you for the next 20 or 30 years, whether you take out a loan against that money or not, the policy grows either way. So now you think mm-hmm. about it, you're a real estate investor, you want to build cash for the future and you want to use that money. Perfect examples. You could use life insurance for that. So the other part is that the loans is that there's a reason, there's a, there, there are logical and mathematical reasons for borrowing against your money. And there's something called an arbitrage too. This is where the growth of the policy actually out outpaces the cost of the, the loan. So you borrow, for mm. example, while you're paying back that loan, by the time you're done paying that back that loan, your cash growth would have exceeded what the, the interest you would have paid to borrow. So you mm. pay interest to borrow the money, but you're also earning interest on your money while it's sitting there. And an arbitrage is when the interest you have outpaces the cost of capital. So yeah. that's a huge advantage, especially for business owners and real estate investors that mm-hmm. they can get that additional edge with their money. So, so let's let's stick with that one because I think that's really yeah. a really interesting concept, especially, yeah. you know, because the I guess the you're right, the biggest objection is like, hey, I've got I've got a hundred grand sitting here, right? Mm-hmm. In cash, right? Why would I open up, you know, spend the next couple of years paying into this policy where I can just buy all cash yeah. with, with with this property? So that made me walk through me an example, right? And how like we can leverage uh, 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 cash value life insurance uh, instead of just using our own cash to to purchase the property. Yeah. So let's say, for example, scenario A. Scenario mm-hmm. A is you have a hundred thousand dollars in cash, mm-hmm. and then you're a real estate investor, and you want to buy, for example, a single family house for a hundred thousand dollars, and your intention is to uh, rent it out. So you scenario A, you just take a hundred thousand dollars in cash from your checking account, buy that property. That's it. You paid up cash, no mortgages, no liens. Um, um, the, this, the advantages, no interest, nothing. You you own the property, all right. The disadvantages, what happened to the hundred thousand dollars now? Now it's in the property. Okay. Um, in order for you to get that hundred thousand dollars back out, you would either have to sell the property or take out a loan against it. Um, scenario B is let's just say you have a hundred and ten thousand dollars. You need a little bit more room. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you buy a single premium policy, a MAC policy, mm-hmm. and then right away you you would be able to borrow a hundred thousand dollars in cash, finance that property now through yourself through the policy, mm-hmm. and then you would use, for example, the rental income you have, uh, pay from the rental income from the tenants you have, pay back the policy loan. Let's just say you do that over a fifteen period year period. Now fast forward fifteen years later, you have your uh, property with depreciation. You have your life insurance policy with the appreciation. You have the loan paid off from the tenant who's been there. So you have more options with scenario B, whereas scenario A is you just you took the $100,000, put it into the property. Let's say you have the rental income. You would have the appreciation still from the house, but no cash uh, life insurance policy that's been appreciating that, that during that entire time. So mm-hmm. long term, you get to do more things with your money when it is being recycled and when it's being leveraged. Mm, very good. Yeah. So I think that's... Um you know, kind of uh, maybe a, a hidden strategy that not many, you know, um, people know about because it, I mean, I think most real, real estate investors understand the concept of leverage because really mm-hmm. this is what you really uh, leverage, leverage, right? But the ability to kind of bypass traditional financing and to now, you know, 15 years later, you know, uh, uh, pick up another property and just, uh, you, you might be familiar with the Burr method, right? Yeah, it's for like, sure. Right? So, you know, it's really just another avenue Right for for someone to um, use uh, instead of pulling cash out of, uh, cash out of the house, they're really just pulling cash out of their policy, right? To do it exactly, yeah. And yeah. the advantage of doing that mm-hmm. is that um, 
there's no there's no qualification for the loan so you can constantly keep putting money in and out of a life insurance policy there's no there's no credit checks or credit history or w-2 forms or 1099 mm -hmm. none of that needed whereas okay. when you have the cash going into properties you mm -hmm. constantly have to qualify for financing the banks okay. have to constantly look at your income your credit history you know you're constantly under mm -hmm. the radar um so you you cut you you, you eliminate that entire objection you know or, or uh or um risk when you have your own source of financing Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, my, I guess my next question is like, you know, uh, obviously, uh, you know, 2008, 2009, a lot of people lost their houses to foreclosure. What happens if we, you know, use this particular method and, you know, the tenants can't pay and you know, if the tenants can't pay, usually the landlord can't pay. So what yes. happens to the loan we take out against the life insurance if, you know, we can't, we can't pay that back? <clears throat> so, so technically when you borrow from the life insurance against life insurance <laughs> policy, um, you technically don't have to pay that loan back. Now, mm -hmm. what would happen is there's interest involved with that loan. So over time, your policy loan balance will grow just like any other loan would grow. Um, if you don't pay it back, the interest would eventually, it would get added into the loan balance and then you would owe more. And if it gets to a certain point where the loan balance exceeds your cash value, then the policy could lapse for, for being insufficient. Um, however, a couple of things with that is one is that while your loan balance is growing, your cash value is also growing too. So if mm -hmm. as long as you can keep supporting the premiums of the policy, then you should be good. And then what would happen is that the life insurance policy would get their money back, the loan back mm -hmm. from the life insurance itself. So if you had a million dollars in life insurance and you had a hundred thousand dollars in an outstanding loan and it's been mm -hmm. growing and then you pass away in the future, your beneficiaries, your family would get one million minus outstanding loan and interest. Let's just say a hundred thousand dollars, so they get a tax-free check for nine hundred thousand dollars. So that's what you could defer your loans all the way into mm. essentially the next generation if you wanted to. <laughs> uh, but the policy has to have sufficient cash value and it has to be paid up. And you know, uh, to do this in the earlier years, I think it's a little bit tricky. But it's our jobs as the advisors to run the math to coordinate with the insurance company when you when you have outstanding loans to make sure like what's the longest period of time to pay this loan back hypothetically mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, all, the, the downside of of course doing that is that you won't be able to keep borrowing again and again if you're not mm -hmm. paying back but i but at the same time it is a great tool for market to get to hedge against these market conditions and market risks because mm -hmm. if something like if in 2008 you know market values everything dropped in 2008 the stock market real estate everything dropped mm -hmm. um but life insurance policy companies and their portfolios did not drop. That's important to note that. The, the, so people who had life insurance policies, cash out life insurance policies, did not see a dip in 2008 and 2009 with the life insurance policies. So you want that as a business owner and a real estate investor. You want your money sitting somewhere that if, if, if the whole world collapsed, you, you're, that pool or that pot of money will not be hindered by the crash. So that's an, kind of important, you know, something as a financial plan I always recommend for clients to have at least one of those tools, one tool mm -hmm. that's not connected to the stock market, real estate, and everything else in the world. Right, right. Okay, here we're here with uh, Sari Ibrahim talking about the bank on yourself uh, strategy. And uh, you do have your own podcast. So I want to, you know, yeah. if you can share about your own podcast. Yeah, definitely. It's called Thinking yeah. Like a Bank. Mm -hmm. And just like the title of it, it's, we're, we're sharing principles and strategies mm -hmm. of thinking like a bank, like saving money, reducing taxes, protecting your wealth, um, just like how banks do. Um, but these strategies are open for anybody to uh, to copy and, and to use. We're, we just launched episode 35. Um, it's a weekly episode that goes out every Wednesday. So, yeah, and I'm looking forward to actually having you on the show. Yeah, yeah, me too. Cool. Yeah. And, and um, we can, I assume we can find iTunes and Spotify, correct? Oh, yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, okay. iTunes, Spotify, uh, YouTube. It's on YouTube. Um, you can find mm -hmm. it on our website. Um, yeah, definitely. All right. Perfect. Um, and so we're kind of at the end here um, before we, uh, you know, close it out. Uh, is there anything else you guys, you wanted to share with us that might be cool? Yeah, definitely. I want to also <laughs> share that, like, if you reach out to us, um, our, our our initial consultation is free, so you can do the financial analysis for free. You can even get the solution to see if it's going to be a good fit for you, all for mm -hmm. free. Um, so you, feel free to reach out to us. No like pressure to like actually start paying before we talk to you. Um, and then the thing too is, if you're not ready for that either, we we have a couple of free books we can send you just for free if you reach out to our website. I can email you the books we as PDF copies, and then they they go into de into detail about the concept, and that'll kind of give you an idea if it, if it's something you want to proceed with after reading the book then you can reach out to us at that point for actual consultations.
Perfect. And, uh, you know, I'll put the uh, links in our show notes. So uh, people who uh, are interested in working for you, they can go directly with links. All right. So we're going to go into the uh, rapid fire section of the show and uh, just answer the first thing that pops in your head as a uh, business owner and entrepreneur. Okay. Yes. Yes. All right. So uh, who do you look up to? I look up to my mentor, Mark Willis. Okay. Uh, What's the best business book you've ever read? Uh, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. All right. Uh, what's the best business advice you've ever received? Best business advice. Um, uh, best business advice. I never take anything personally. Very personally. All right. Um, if there is one thing you can do over again, what would it be? If I could do one thing over again, um, oh, this is a tough one. Um, I would I would get into sales and marketing at a younger age. All right. And then finally, um, well, actually two more questions. Um, uh, are you familiar with the concept three feet from gold? No, no. Tell me. Okay. Tell me. Uh, so this story is like, you know, the, the, uh, the ma- um, there's a guy who goes out gold prospecting and, you know, he buys all the equipment and stuff. And then, you know, he, d- he works and works and works and he just can't, you know, he's not hitting any gold veins. So he sells it to the next guy and the next guy digs three feet and he hits gold. <laughs> Okay. And so, um, so, uh, m- my question is, I ask this question a lot cause I'm curious about how, how different people answer this. So how do you know when you're three feet from gold or when to pivot in your business? I guess you would have milestones and certain things that you want to accomplish. Like for example, like if your goal was to sell um, like a product to a hundred people, um, the the difference between the gold and not could it, it's not necessarily the actual one hundred clients being closed, but it could be that you have one hundred one one two hundred people that are interested at least in speaking to you. So there could be milestones in between you and your actual goals that mm-hmm. are indicators of like should you keep proceeding or not. All right, and finally, what's the biggest challenge in your business today? Biggest challenge is um, uh, it's spreading the word. That's very difficult for me to do. That's why I have the podcast. That's why I'm on your show. Um, it's something that I'll always be able, I, I need to keep doing. It's keep spreading the word. All right. Sorry, Ibrahim, with uh, Bank on Yourself. Uh, we'll put the website uh, that people can go to in our show notes. And hey, thanks again for uh, you. you know coming on the show. The topic was really interesting, really fascinating. So I'm happy to have shared it with our listeners today. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for having me on. All right. My pleasure.